This is my 1993 Cadillac Seville STS with 240,000 kilometers or 150,000 miles on the clock. Yes, it has the infamous Northstar V8 engine. I bought this car from a somewhat questionable dealership to put it lightly, offered for $1600 or 1400 euros. This makes it one of the cheapest running Northstar Cadillacs in the world, as the car also had a clean title with a past annual inspection. This is based on the cars available on the websites Auto Tempest and Resucar. My purchase was intentional as I wanted to see if the Northster engine was in fact as unreliable as people claimed it to be, and my reasoning was that a high mileage car would be free of the notorious head gasket failure that typically appears sooner in these cars. While this sounds like quite the bargain for a V8 Cadillac of any kind, especially considering the fact that it's a mere 2% of its original purchasing price, it wasn't exactly problem free from the lot. What's even more shocking was how competitively priced it was by the dealership, as they would also have to sell it for a profit. In spite of this, the seller assured me that it was in good condition and that the car had been serviced, including an oil change, quite recently. I took the car out on a test drive and immediately noticed that the gear shifter knob was absolutely ravaged. I literally had to remove it in order to put the car into drive as the mechanism was broken. What remained was the hollow thin base of the gear shifter resembling a straw. There was also a large crack in the windshield and more importantly a warning message on the dash indicating a low coolant level suggesting a potential head gasket problem that is a known issue on the Norster engine. In any case the car seemed to run fine during my 15 minutes of driving with no apparent signs of overheating or white smoke from the exhaust. However, at the time I did not know how to check the coolant temperature as the 90s GM Cadillac's dash layout wasn't at first very intuitive for a European like myself, so I had no way to really keep track of it at the time. Considering the low price and the exclusivity of the car, let alone the amazing sound of the exhaust, it was a purchase too tempting to refuse and I decided to take the risk and buy it the day after. Have a listen. In a worst case scenario I'd be able to sell the car in parts, including the wheels, which would get me back at least a third of the purchase price. My luck ended rather abruptly after I left the dealership as not only the check engine light turned on but also the car overheating only 20 minutes later. At this point I was for obvious reasons convinced that I had bought a lemon, but I was eager to get the car back home and diagnose the issues. The only problem was that I was two hours away from my home in the middle of Swedish winter with the sun about to set. The journey back home was arduous to say the least. I didn't want to take the highway as I knew the car would overheat over and over again after allowing it to cool down, which it also turned out to do. For that reason I had to settle with rather tiny country roads, where I could pull over easily if need be. Periodically I stopped by gas stations to buy coolant, and this seemed to fix the problem momentarily. However, the amount of coolant needed was much greater than I had initially anticipated, so it took a while and multiple stops to get the level topped off. Throughout this process the check engine light disappeared out of nowhere and remarkably the car would not overheat after a while, allowing me to finish my drive home without much hassle. Perhaps the car wasn't in such poor shape after all. My victory was rather short lived as the car would start to overheat again the day after, but I managed to narrow it down to a coolant leak as there was noticeable dripping underneath the car, seemingly from the radiator. The best course of action would have been to identify the source of the leak and get it sorted out, but as the car was so cheap in the first place I decided to go with the most convenient option, a coolant leak sealant by BARS. Not sponsored by the way. I knew the risk of plugging up my heater core and causing even more problems based on horror stories I'd read online, but I decided it was worth trying given the situation. I topped off my coolant level, added the coolant leak pellets to my coolant hose and remarkably the car would never overheat again and that is still keeping its temperature perfectly even on hot days in stop and go traffic. So if you're having coolant leak issues on your own beater car and don't want to spend the time and money to identify and fix the leak, it's definitely worth a try. But note that I would never take the risk on a car in better condition, in that case it's better to get it sorted out properly. With this initial hurdle aside, this 26 year old car with 240,000 kilometers on the clock and improper maintenance has turned out to be extremely reliable. 
I've driven it daily for several months and it has never broken down or stranded me, which is quite respectable for a car with clearly neglected service history and 13 previous owners. That being said, it still has a plethora of cosmetic, electrical and mechanical problems. Starting with the exterior, the car is clearly not in great shape cosmetically. I wouldn't call it unsightly and it could be much worse, but the amount of paint defects and dodgy paint jobs are seemingly endless. A detailer's nightmare, if you will. I've tried to restore it somewhat through polishing and waxing, however with varying degrees of success. First of all, it has sharp dents on both the driver and passenger door, the latter appearing to have had a cheap repair job with body filler, which definitely did not make it look better. What's worse is the condition of the rear bumper, as you might already have noticed by now. The paint is faded and peeling, and I only made the condition worse by attempting to polish it in hopes to rejuvenate it. That's why you should always test the paint in an inconspicuous area first, but as the bumper was already in desperate need of a respray, I wasn't overly concerned. Unfortunately, it had the opposite effect, leaving behind an unsightly white residue that only made matters worse. However, my polishing did prove to be successful on some severely oxidized panels that had normal paint, like the wheel arches and the lower panels of the doors. There have also been attempts by the previous owners to touch up the paint on the hood and quarter panels, but not executed very well as you can see as they literally sprayed over the areas instead of doing a proper touch-up job. There are also remnants of the overspray on the headlight assembly and one of the fog lights, leaving behind this interesting blue tinge. Speaking of the hood, the heat insulator in the engine bay is absolutely torn apart and I question whether this nifty engine light actually still works. The taillights have also seen better days, being scratched, faded, misaligned and also moldy on the sides. They also tend to fog up in wet weather, which is a common problem on these. In addition, my third brake light strip is sadly not working, a piece that I find to be iconic and unique on this car that definitely adds to its appearance. For reference, here's a picture of a working one. To make matters worse, my trunk has quite a serious water leak, likely because of a bad rubber seal somewhere. Surprisingly it's not filled with mold yet, but it's only a matter of time. Speaking of the trunk, there's quite a strange trunk soft closing mechanism on this car that is clearly not working as intended these days. It's supposed to assist with closing the trunk without having to slam it like in a regular car, but instead of relying on a vacuum system like the Mercedes-Benz S-Class of this period, it has a motor that does the work. Although this is a clever idea in itself, it appears that my mechanism has malfunctioned quite a bit as the motor keeps running while the trunk is open, making it sound like some kind of death trap contraption from a horror movie while the metal part moves up and down. Have a listen. As you can imagine, this complicates loading baggage somewhat. What is truly a death trap however is this car itself. It was never exactly known for being safe as it was given a poor rating by the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety back in the days, and the safety of my particular car has only declined with age. Although my car is surprisingly rust free considering it's been driven in rough Swedish climate with salt on the roads in the winter, making the frame retain its sturdiness, I suspect that my airbag has been tampered with in one way or another throughout the years, making it something I'm definitely not relying on to deploy in the case of an accident. On a positive note, it's possible that the passenger airbag is still working, which by the way was quite modern for a car in 1993. I might also add that my horn is not working either, indicating even further that a previous owner has at some point opened up the steering wheel to fix something. Moreover, my windshield is completely cracked and it's only gotten worse as I've been driving it daily. It's clearly due for a replacement as also starting to affect the visibility now. On top of all of this, the car has a serious exhaust leak by the driver's side, which isn't exactly ideal as exhaust fumes get into the cabin with the windows open and the fan turned on when the car is not in motion. My headlights also stop working suddenly, which forced me to drive with either faint daytime running lights or high beams during nighttime, which is of course a safety hazard in itself. Fortunately, I managed to remedy this by using the output of the daytime running lights to power the headlights, as the headlight wiring appeared to be faulty. Not an ideal repair, but at least to fix the problem. And not only that, but it seems as though I have a leak in the fuel filler hose as I can feel a strong gasoline smell at the rear of the car. I'm not sure how much this affects my fuel economy, but it certainly is already excessive as it is, despite the Norser being a relatively fuel efficient V8 engine. Moving on to the suspension, that too has in better days. While I wouldn't say that the car rides poorly, it is clear that it's worn out and certainly not working as it should. It's particularly noticeable when driving over speed bumps and road imperfections, as the car jolts harshly. There's also a warning message on the dash reading service ride control, which is a common problem on these cars. 
The cause of this is unclear, and Cadillacs of this age can with sophisticated electrical suspension to not only sense the road ahead for a more comforting ride, but also controlling the firmness of the ride based on speed. This complicates matters as it's difficult to know whether it's mechanical or electrical in nature, and I can imagine that it's an expensive fix no matter what. For that reason I haven't looked into it yet as it doesn't bother me all that much during regular driving. On the topic of electrical problems, one that arose unexpectedly during my ownership has to do with the anti-theft system of the car. One day when driving the warning message, theft system problem, car may not restart, showed up on the instrument cluster, which wasn't exactly reassuring as it could potentially leave you stranded somewhere. The message itself is formulated in a peculiar way, as it doesn't tell the driver whether the car actually will start again, making it a bit of a gamble every time you want to start the car, especially if you are far away from home. If the car is not in a good mood one particular day, it could very well reject you from starting the engine in the first place, leaving you in misery and having to call for a tow truck. This warning message never actually did anything to my car and it would start up fine every time until recently. It would say the car was disabled and refused to crank the engine, but it was fortunately fixed by plugging out the battery for an hour or two. This problem is also common on these cars and is usually related to worn wires connected to the ignition lock cylinder, but fortunately it's not a difficult fix as there are ways to trick the system using resistors. All in all, quite a sophisticated system for its time, for better or worse as with all of these electrical systems. The interior is in decent shape considering the car's age and mileage. There is visible wear and tear on the plush front leather seats and mismatched panels here and there, but nothing out of the ordinary apart from the center console ashtray being loose. The wood veneer on the trim pieces, notably in the center console, is cracked and warped which happens quite commonly on any car with age and sun exposure. All of the electric windows work except the rear driver window, and remarkably, the power antenna is still working despite this car being so neglected. What's also impressive is the pristine condition of the rear seats that have most likely never been used, despite the copious amounts of legroom in this car. As mentioned before, the gear shifter knob was ruined but it was easily replaced by a working one I found on eBay for $25 in the same color and with a working mechanism. What is also interesting is that the car came with a 1993 Eldorado owner's manual. Don't ask me why. And oh, my uh, air conditioning is not working due to low refrigerant levels. Although I wouldn't be surprised if the AC compressor is also faulty. What is also odd is that the rearview mirror seems to have been replaced with a cheap aftermarket one. I wonder what the story behind that decision was. Although this long and exhaustive list of problems makes it seem as though the car is in awful shape, it has nonetheless treated me well during these months of ownership as it's been running so well mechanically with only a few electrical gremlins here and there. The Cadillac Seville is a tremendously comfortable land yacht with such unique personality, attributed to its intoxicating V8 rumble and its imposing presence, and it's definitely a car I don't regret buying considering the price I got it for. Although the Norster engine has a bad reputation, I would definitely say that it's better and more durable than people give it credit for, assuming it doesn't suffer from the head gasket failure due to the poorly designed head bolts. Thank you for watching. I'll be posting more content of this car in the future, so stay tuned if you want to see more. If you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing and pressing the like button. Also, feel free to give me feedback if there is something you think I can improve upon. I'm new to YouTube and video making, so there's still much I can learn. Until next time.